Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final episode for the month of October. Happy early Halloween, everybody. I'm your host, Gabriel Garcia, otherwise known as the Wandering Quill and the Wandering Scribe. And today, to mark off officially the end of October, we have a first-timer here on the show making her official debut. She is a learning and information professional who also moonlights as a history blogger and content creator. She's the owner and founder of The Bookish Historian, where she spends most of her spare time researching, attempting to write, designing new products, and plotting world domination. Sounds like another colleague that I know. She lives in Pennsylvania with her husband and two cats, the latter of which she serves faithfully. So let's give a huge round of applause to our newest guest on the show. And as I said in the beginning, headlining the end of the month of October and early Halloween, everyone. Historian and blogger and book lover, Amy Williams. Amy, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Yeah, thank you very much for having me, Gabriel, and thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, so to kind of add a little bit more onto that, um, I actually work as an instructional technology specialist at a university here in Pennsylvania. Effectively, what that means is I'm tech support um, for <laughs> online learning systems and tools and technology. And um, and then again, by, by, by moonlight, I run the bookish historian and so I do blogging. I run a Substack publication. I read a um, little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in history from a small university in Wisconsin, as well as a master's degree in public history and a, another master's degree in library and information science. So history has always been my passion and um, it's been a, it's, it's been a lot of fun to be able to kind of turn that into a side hustle as well. Awesome. So let's actually dive into that as a little teaser for your uh, blog, The Bookish Historian. So for people who are just now discovering The Bookish Historian, what is exactly The Bookish Historian uh, main focus? I know I've had a chance to look at it. It is a history blog, but what kind of history blog is it? Yeah, so probably like a lot of people, my my interests in history are a little <laughs> are pretty varied. Um, primarily, I enjoy blogging about European history, medieval history specifically, um, some early modern as well. Um, and it's been fun over you know as I'm reading and different books um, that strike my interest. Sometimes I dive into ancient history a little bit, and then. Um, some aspects of American history as well. So I'm anything usually before 1800 is something <laughs> that I'm interested in. Um, and so the bookish historian focuses primarily on trying to educate and help people understand that history isn't just dates and it's not boring. It's about patterns and stories. And I mean, there admittedly, I'm one of those weird people who enjoys diving down Wikipedia holes and <laughs> uh, looking at um, genealogical tables. But that being said, my whole purpose is to just educate and share books that I'm interested in and things like that. It's just trying to get my love of history out to the wider world. And then that's taken on in the last few years a few different Nice. So now let's actually talk about sort of this emergence of the book as a story. And so let's start at the beginning. So <clears throat> growing up, were you always fascinated in history or did that come about later in life? Yeah. So I've always actually been interested in history. Um, when I was in high school, I initially wanted to go and I wanted to be working about wildlife biology or be a conservation biologist or something like that. Um, but I joined a program called Academic Decathlon, which Ooh. teaches you all sorts of, it, each year focuses on a specific historical topic. So one year it was the Renaissance, one year it was um, China, things like that. And so what was really cool was that it you read and researched and learned about so many different facets of history. So music and art and literature and politics and social. And we had these massive binders of content and information. And then we got quizzed on it. And it sounds <laughs> a 
probably where I realized I was a little bit of a nerd. But it, being a part of that and competing in that kind of sparked my interest. And um, in high school, I discovered or learned more about the Tudor dynasty. And that was kind of my gateway drug into the wider world of English history. And so as I moved from high school to college, I that, I, that was when I decided that I wanted to be a history major instead of um, going into biology. And the bookish historian specifically actually started as a blog way back when called My Life is History. I started that in 2010. Never kept up with it very much, but it was supposed to be a way for me to chronicle my time when I studied abroad in England as a junior in college. And um, in 2021 was when I decided to kind of scuttle all of that and start brand new um, with something that was a little more polished, a little more branded, um, that looked a little less like uh, late teenage, early 20s angst. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So would you say that was around the time when you had your aha moment, as you said, that this is something that I want to do because I'm very passionate about it? Yeah, I think especially in 2021 when I really started, like I said, I've always been interested, um, but it was in 2021 when I really started focusing on the social media presence and trying to pull something together into something a little more cohesive than just an occasional blog post or um, news article or something like that. Definitely. You know, 2021 was, I would definitely say, like the emergence of you know, people making, you know, content for people who are never content creators. Now they are content creators. I myself am now, you know, in that group uh, when I started. It's crazy how, you know, quarantine and that uh, those, pre those past few years really changed, you know, everything for a lot of people. And for a lot of people I've met on the show, you know, it was for the best how it gave them time to figure out, what kind of person they want to be, you know, going forward in their careers, which is, you know, really, really incredible. So now let's talk about with the book historian, it's already established, or at least the idea is established. So going forward for you, Amy, did you have any goals uh, in mind for yourself when creating this blog, as well as goals for your prospective viewers who came across your blog? Yeah, absolutely. So something that I've been devoting a lot of time and energy on is actually Substack publication. And for those who are unfamiliar, Substack is, is a platform that invites writers and readers to connect. And it differs from a lot of other platforms such as WordPress or Medium or anywhere where you, you develop your own website or have a specific platform that you're writing on. Substack really focuses on putting the power of content creation and writing into the hands of their, into the hands of those who are actually writing. And I'm not trying to make it sound like a huge, <laughs> um, a, like a huge advertisement, but I have found it to be a very liberating experience because I do have a website it's currently under construct reconstruction. Um, and it, the, the primary drive for me to focus on that was I wasn't obsessed with SEO and things like that and trying to get keywords. And and by now, I've, I'm a proficient enough writer where a lot of that I can already anticipate in my writing process. But mm. I can focus on researching and writing. And, and it was nice. I've been on Substack about two years now. And it's been nice because they've it's, it's still a new company, but they're, they're growing and they're changing and they're increasing ways for people to discover content and to engage with each other. And so that's where a lot of my focus has been over the last few months, um, in addition to the online store component. Um, but for right now, in terms of content creation, that's been my primary focus as my Instagram um, has slowly but surely seen an uptake in followers and things like that. So I have a pretty good rhythm there with what I do. And so it's been nice to be able to focus on that for the near future while I try to drive more engagement and subscriptions and things like that. Nice. And when, what was sort of like the initial reaction from like friends, family and work colleagues who, you know, discovered that you were working on, you know, this blog of yours, 
Was it positive, negative, or somewhere down the middle? No, everything, everybody has been overwhelmingly positive and supportive. Um, there are a few, there are a bunch of subscribers and they'll read um, anything that I read. And I actually, my oldest sister is a subscriber and she, oh, every time I talk with her on the phone, she's talking about how great it is that she's learned something and saying, it's, it's so fascinating. I didn't know this. And I've, my, my poor husband listens to me <laughs> <laughs> yammer on about whatever it is that I'm writing about that week. And he's been, he may not be, he's very supportive. He may not, may not be his most favorite thing in the world to read because he's not as much into history as I am. Um, but by far and large people have, no one's ever said, this is a terrible idea. Why are you wasting your time and energy on something like this? And for especially my co friends who knew me or who've known me since college, I've, it was no secret that I loved English history. And so if that's one thing people know about me is they know I love Tudor history. And so that that's something that tends to stick with them, which I think is kind of cool. Nice. You're now probably in the category of a lot of people I've had on this show who specialize in like talking about, writing about, or just spreading the word about uh, Tudor history, which it's just so, I probably listened to more Tudor history in just this month alone and the previous month than anywhere else. I would have thought there was nothing else to talk about than, you know, the Tudor dynasty or anything else about English history, at least at that period. But that's a beautiful thing about history. There's always something new, uh, coming up. And so would you also agree that, you know, those positive interactions in a way sort of validated your goals? Uh, that the blog had very much so um, but something that's kind of been an unexpected not a consequence but an unexpected happening was as I've started doing you know posting about books that I read or things things of that nature it, it's been fun to build connections with authors and publishers and book PR firms and mm. companies to help promote books as well. And I know there are a lot, there are a lot of influencers and creators and things and, you know, um, Instagrammers out there that focus on that. So I know I'm not, I'm one of millions, but I think for me, it's been particularly special and validating that what I write and what I sink so much time and energy into, and people are finding value in it, especially, you know, these, these larger publishers that will reach out to me. I think it's so gratifying to know that not only am I'm not going to say not wasting my time, but I'm not wasting my time, but also that people find value in what I have to say, which I think is probably, it, it, you, you always want to make sure to find value in what you're doing. And so it's been gratifying that that has been an outcome that I never expected really starting this um, when I did. I, I also have to agree. I've also had, you know, very similar experiences. Um, I actually worked with a friend of mine in England who has his uh, own website, uh, History with Jackson. And I've worked with him on a few occasions where uh, he'll reach out to me saying, hey, I don't know if you're busy, but, you know, I have this book that I think you'd be really interested in reading. And, you know, I would read it and, you know, provide like my own feedback and thoughts on it. And I've done it for at least a few of his the books that, you know, he sent me. And those are from publishers in the UK, specifically from uh, Pen and Sword. Mm -hmm. And it, it's really, really fascinating and very, you know, very humbling, you know, that, you know, you know, they're reaching out to my friend Jackson and he's reaching out to me and trusting my input and my specialty to provide, you know, a very honest review that's going to tell what the book is about and also try to entice people to check it out. So that is a very, very humbling experience. And kind of on that note, it definitely goes back to what you said about, you know, sense of validation because, you know, for content creators, especially historical content creators, it's not a very easy field to go into, especially on if we're looking at YouTube, Instagram, or TikTok. I've seen a lot of people go into this uh, field, and the term that keeps popping up is known as like the armchair historian. In fact, there's actually one YouTuber that's called the armchair historian where they, you know, research, they gather information, and they provide great content. Now, on one side of the coin, you have those that are really, really good researchers and really great uh, writers who can craft incredible stories. 
for their content. But on the other side of the coin, you also have those that, you know, they talk about it. And while they may not have like a lot of research backing it, they're able to weave in a way that's very narrative driven, very cinematic, as I like to say. But then you also have the other side for both of those where people would uh, call out. I don't know if this ever happened uh, to you, um, Amy, where people will mess saying, oh, you do not know what you're talking about. You're not a historian. You're just a history enthusiast. And there's that kind of deflates, you know, a person's drive and self-esteem. And that imposter syndrome really sets in uh, really hard. So for you, Amy, did you ever have like, you know, those moments of like, you know, anxiety or imposter syndrome? And if not, uh, what continue to discipline you to do what you're doing now because this is something you are truly passionate about. Yeah, um, I have been very fortunate where I haven't had to worry or I haven't experienced a lot of external pressures or things where somebody said your content sucks or this isn't right or what credentials do you have in order to be a historian? But so a lot of the pressure comes internally and Mm. we are all subject to anybody who's a content creator, whether on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, any of them, you're subject to the whims of the algorithm. And that can, for me, I've, oh, I'm still every day. I still constantly, not a little bit better, but have compared myself against accounts who do very similar things and have all of these different, like, a nice aesthetic and things of that nature and they'll have like two three four five six times as many followers as I do and there's nothing saying that what I create is terrible Mm. um but it it, like in my head when I'm seeing you know when you're trying to track engagement and things like that it's it can be it can feel disheartening as as especially for somebody like me who's an introvert anyways where you think you're just not doing right, you're not doing what the the trends tell you to do. Um, but on the other side of that is, you know, I do my research like everybody else does on trends and things like that. But some of them, I just it's almost like I don't have the energy or the time <laughs> to focus on doing. Like for me, a, a lot of it's more static creation, such like images. Mm. And that I don't do a lot of video content or reels because I just don't, that's not something that I've always been passionate about there. I, I, I'm coming around to it a little more with different things with templates and stuff like that. But my focus has been more on the, the more static content creation and in a system that focuses more on the videos and media and things like that, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Of course, I'm not trying to demean it in any way. It's just more of like, well, where is this going to leave me in this big bubble of of content creation? And so that's been a little disheartening here and there. Mm. But on the flip side, hearing comments from people about, you know, friends that I've made through the entire process, it's it, it's like, no, the content I create isn't terrible. Um, and I may not have as many followers as the next person, but the followers I do have, they're quality followers. And that, to me, I think is the most important thing is, or it's, it's don't, if you're stuck in the same rut I am, don't, it can be easy to get stuck in the numbers game, but focus on the connections you made, because ultimately that is the most important thing other than, you know, learning and sharing your passion. Definitely 100%. And I 100% have to agree. When I first started the YouTube game, I was a little intimidated because I'm not a content creator, like at all. I just have a YouTube page that I started back in high school. I had to do it for a school project and I haven't used my YouTube channel. I started in 2013, never used it. And I recently used it back in 2022. That's a long, long time. When I jumped on, I was like, well, okay, now I'm, I'm just going to keep doing this. And it just spiraled into these new things where now I have a newsletter that's tied to my YouTube channel. I have, you know, all these different playlists that I do, which is from historian interviews, author interviews, book impressions, comic impressions, and now the new audiobook series. It's crazy. I never would have imagined doing all this stuff 
But, you know, at the end of the day, my passion is, of course, you know, writing and history. And this allows me to do both, to meet historians from different backgrounds, different fields, uh, different journeys of their life, which is very incredible. And also making almost like the business side behind it. It's like, you know, how do I build my brand as, you know, a content creator, which actually is perfect because now we're going to focus in on the business side of being a historian. So let's actually talk about that part, uh, Amy. So what was sort of like the moment when you realized that you want to transform the books historian from, you know, just a blog for a hobby, but also turn into a business in a sense? Yeah, so that's a really fascinating question, and it was, it's kind of been a little sporadic, to be perfectly honest. I think some of it started, I, it was a, it was at least, so I started the online, my online store, The Scroll and Quill, um, last year, and I think what prompted me to want to, um, to monetize a little bit more was the amount of energy and money I was spending. So it was very, it was a practical driven decision in some aspect. Um, and so I was like, well, how can I potentially start generating a little bit of income? Not, not obviously to replace my, my day-to-day -day job. Right. But, you know, how can I maybe try to supplement mine a little bit? Because I also do some freelancing on the side and that mm. has kind of fallen to the wayside right now, which is, which is fine. And, and so looking at, because I, I have spent a significant amount of money over, you know, the last few years trying to get my website up and running, making sure you know, hosting and themes and trying to do X, Y, and Z to make sure that everything worked. It was the way that it was supposed to. Right. And so it kind of, I don't know this, what specifically drove me, but when I started the process, I started looking at some wholesale items that I could sell on the um, mm. Shopify store. And so fair.com is a, is a marketplace where people who have, you know, created all sorts of homemade items or whatever items. It's, it's like Etsy, but for wholesale. Uh, okay. <laughs> and, um, and so, and it's where a lot of people, if they have like a brick and mortar store, they'll buy, they'll buy wholesale and then, they'll resell the product. So it's really like no different than a lot of other um, industries in that way. And so I started focusing on just a few different things um, like bookmarks, or I have these th items called book darts, which it's another type of annotation tool. Um, and since then it's kind of expanded into looking at publishers who may have, who sell really great products that I, that I adore. And then it's like, okay, so how, can I not get into the game, but you know, how can I start utilizing some of that? Right. And then this year, this year turned into, so what can I make? <laughs> <laughs> and that's exploded into me getting a laser engraver and getting um, um, what they call a sublimation printer, which is effectively mm -hmm. printing on a hard surface like coasters or, or soft services like tote bags or making t-shirts ah. and things like that. And so it, it started to morph into this blob of all <laughs> sorts of things. And so a lot of that has, and that was when I decided to do the offshoot of the scroll and quill. Um, and so in addition to that, because I know there are plenty of influencers out there who, who use affiliate marketing and things like that. And I started looking at that for a while, but in some aspect because and i did this for actually as a freelancer i did write some affiliate articles where effectively you're just doing research pulling in links and things like that and it felt very dishonest to me again not mm. saying that anybody who creates them um not saying that anybody who does it is automatically unethical or dishonest or something but it it left a bitter taste in my mouth and so mm. if there were any products i was going to sell it'd be something that i can get my hands on that i've used or that i suspect would be would be great. And so that was when I decided to steer away from that type of affiliate marketing. And in terms of um, another avenue of revenue, potentially, Substack has the ability. It's like a Patreon type feature where oh, you okay. can subscribe if you want. Um, 
And so I've been dabbling with that a little bit. I have one paid subscriber, which is awesome. Um, but mo all of the content that I'm creating there, I don't plan to hide for the most part behind a paywall. Um, and if I do, it would be additional articles maybe for a specific segment of the, of, you know, somebody who pays, but for right now, I don't plan to pay well any of my content in any, any subscription for the most part would be like a, a tip for lack of a better word. So right. I, it, it's been fun or it's, it's been a little, it's been a lot of brain power trying to figure out. So how can I recoup some of what I've spent, but also still provide a good experience and not try to, you know, not try to make it seem like I'm in it for the money because that's not what I'm here for at all. Right. Right. You know, absolutely. 100%. And now, uh, let's turn you towards uh, your audience for your blog, because the audience is very important because you want your content to be, you know, generally speaking, in the history field where it's engaging and academic, but the language and or how it's written can, oh, <laughs> little glitch came up, or you, you're all good. Uh, yep, what was I saying? Oh, where sort of like it's a balance between it's academic for people who really know the history, but not so academic that people who are just now learning about this topic can understand it. So for you, Amy, generally speaking, who would you say your audience is? And do you have a good understanding of your audience? That's a wonderful question. Uh, I, I would say for primarily for Instagram and Facebook, I try to, my, my target audience is anybody who may not know all that much about whichever topic I'm talking about. And so how I've tried to tailor my language is very, I try not to fluff it up too much. Um, I think that too much fluff is just does a disservice if, um, in, in some cases, in some cases, not to, not to come across as like, you know, when you're trying to deliver a story or a narrative, sometimes the the fluff can oversee the details, especially mm -hmm. in such you know, in a place where you have a very limited amount of space. Yeah. Um, so in a blog post, it's entirely different. If in a blog post, I will add all sorts of X, Y, and Z fluff type of stuff. But for something like Instagram, I try to keep it as concise as I can while still being informative and interesting. Um, and something I do do, depending uh, to especially to appeal to more of the academics, if there if anybody ever cares, is um, if I feature an artwork or something, I will do like an an appropriate attribution and things like that. So I, I hope that showcases that I do take it seriously, even if my primary audience I suspect are. Um, those who may just be more, not, not again, not just history, but like history enthusiasts who may just be discovering a certain particular topic. Um, I will say though, from what I understand a lot of, because I try to straddle both history and books, mm. a lot of my audience tends to fall, um, I, I know I've connected with a lot of authors, publishers, um, book, book, again, bookstagrammers, book enthusiasts, things like that. So it's, my followers are very wide spectrum. I know there are plenty of academics who follow me as well um, and that I reciprocally follow. Um, and so it's, it's kind of been fascinating to see the, not only the types of people who, who engage with me and follow me, but also who consistently <laughs> still engage with my content. And so it's, it's, it's really interesting to see how, um, how that's developed over time too. Awesome. And kind of as a little, tangent question but definitely one i think is very important which would you say or i say what book that you reviewed and posted on your blog was the one that probably garnered the most traffic that took you by surprise that is a really great question um so there so the one that kind of sticks out that um the one that sticks out actually was a book about, it was a Tim Clarkson biography of Ethel Flood, who was the Lady of the Mercy. And so she was a 10th century, um, 10th, 11th century noble woman who mm. kind of assumed the reigns of power as, um, you know, in the, in Anglo-Saxon England, 
um, you know, working with to um, to stave off Viking incursions and things like that. And it was really interesting to see that that particular review garnered a lot of traffic and things of that nature, which led me, because I don't really take my approach to book reviews. It's all pretty much the same with how I write and what I focus on and things like that. And so I think it gave me some good insight as to what specific types of historical periods that people were interested oh, in. Okay. Because I'll put, um, I've reviewed book, like more modern books. Um, there was one that I recently reviewed that was more like 1960s environmental history and things like that. It was a novel. And those, I, I have found so far that a lot of my American history posts haven't garnered as much engagement not saying i would it would stop me from doing that because those books are just as fascinating but it's it's interesting to see like how my readership or my viewership may skew towards specific aspects of history that's for sure definitely and that kind of sounds like you know or to me it correl it may correlate with of course you know the last kingdom series on netflix which for people who don't know what that is that is pretty much, at the time, the BBC's answer to history's Vikings, which followed uh, Uther, son of Uther, who was an Anglo-Saxon, but raised as a Dane, who became the sword bearer to King Alfred. And the whole show and the movie was all about England, as we know today, forming all the different kingdoms from Northumbria, East Anglia, Wessex, Mercia. There's probably one more that I'm blanking on that all came uh, together. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, Alfred's oldest daughter was known as the Lady of Mercia, who, of course, very famous, taking the reins from her husband after he died, fought against the Vikings. So that may have uh, contributed to the the influx of people uh joining uh your site and reading your review on that book yeah and i i hope and it was particularly fascinating at least with her was that she's really for the most part she's probably the anglo-saxon woman who the chronicles have written about the most which mm -hmm. i think really i mean there's a dearth of sadly there's a dearth of documents from that area that have survived but i i think that you bring up a really great point that, you know, that something like a phenomena such as that has started driving interest in learning about the period. And I, I think that that's such a, a, an amazing relationship between media of what media people consume and then, you know, wanting to spark that interest in finding out more. Definitely. Definitely. And the next question, which I think is a very important one, and I'm really eager to hear your thoughts on this, Amy is, well, I'll lay context for this question. So originally there was a question that I had on the show for both my authors and historians, which were, you know, who are the historians that helped you craft your voice as a historian? But recently I had a guest from my author um, lineup who kind of flipped that question where he said, I could list the authors who helped mold me, but at the end of the day, it's pretty much my voice that people are seeing. Yes, I'll be inspired by so-and-so, but all at the end of the day, it's my voice that I want people to know. And that's kind of the same line or the same view when it comes to history. Yes, we could reference all the famous historians and historical authors who have influenced us and helped us craft our approach to history, our stances. But at the end of the day, what we write, no matter what discipline we are, it's our voice. So... For you, Amy, how have you sort of balanced this off? And it's kind of going back to the previous question again, where you are showing that, you know, you know what you're talking about. These are the people that have really helped you sort of craft your voice in terms of like, okay, how do I write about history where it's still engaging and still academic and scholarly, but people who are not academic or scholarly can still understand it. And then also balancing your own voice, your own authenticity to show, this is me, I know what I'm talking about, I have done the research, I can write about uh, history. 
So I so I would like to say I've always been a fairly strong writer, um, and probably my at my professors in college probably enabled me a little too much in terms of hey everything's great. <laughs> <laughs> like suggestions for improvement. There's nothing on them. Um, but I, and I was actually thinking about this the other day. There in high school actually, so I can very you clearly identify someone who's helped me become a much better writer and helped set the stage for how things have developed and i'm still developing so when i was in high school we had to take a writing class and one of them was expository writing mm. and everybody it was one of those like classes nobody ever like it was it was known to be hard and the teacher she was supposed to be really just just a tough teacher very nice but very tough well i took her class anyways <laughs> <laughs> and it was probably more than any history class I ever took. It was the most formative writing class I've ever had, whether in that I could, that I can think of. And it was one of those just how she explained it, um, the encouragement she gave me, and, and still telling me, you know, how I can improve. Um, it really set the stage for. It really, really set the stage for how I approach my writing. And the thing that sticks out the most, which is a little bit at odds with history writing, is the idea of using passive voice. So instead of saying England was conquered by William the Conqueror in 1066, you flip that and use an active verb and say um, William the Conqueror invaded and conquered England in 1066. And I think a lot of the best writers, best history writers and authors and even non-history writers that I read focus on using um, as much as they can, of course, even in, even in just very straight up uh, nonfiction history books, utilize that active voice versus the, the passive voice. And again, there are instances where there's just no two ways about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you, the, the way that you want to say something, there's no way to make it active no matter what you do. But I think that's how I try to, for the most part, approach my writing. It, and I think that's played a huge role in me being able to try to write engaging, but also informative and effective content has been try to make it so it's not like you're reading a history textbook with all of your focus on dates. Yeah. And I and I think like just just remembering, I miss you, Mrs. Kitsy. <laughs> she it was um it, it's just it helped to formulate like how I think about writing. And I think that you're never too old or never too like far gone to try to learn more about the actual craft of writing. And I think that it's so easy to rely on AI these days um, mm -hmm. to have that, to write content for you. Not say, again, not saying that that's a bad thing and I've used it occasionally to track things, but I think that being able to try to work on and hone your own voice over time, I think is, is, is something that we should all try to strive for. Well, then I didn't get out too much off on tangent about that. But you know what? I, I 100 percent agree, Amy. And you know, I had two professors who, you know, did almost the very same thing with me. Um, my high school history teacher, um, Mrs. Check, who now is known by uh, Mrs. Singleton, and she got married uh around the time I was still in high school, and she was probably like the first person that really ingrained me into uh history. Uh shout out to Ms. Singleton best history teacher in SoCal. And then when I went to college to get my master's degree, there was one professor that really stood out and that was of course Professor Dennis Campbell. He's a Roman historian. And honestly, he's the best Roman historian, Roman teacher I have ever had. And on his first, on the first day of class, he pretty much said this, I'm not going to sugarcoat what the Romans did. I am going to curse. I am going to swear. I am probably going to talk about all the debauchery that the Romans did because that is who they were. And I absolutely loved it. And, you know, his approach to history really inspired me. And because of him, I was able to get like a few more books on Rome that I really would not have gotten if I had not taken his class. And from those books, they've helped me understand history a little bit better from my background. They've helped me approach my writing uh, similarly. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're all trying to improve our writing. We're all trying to be better versions of ourselves. 
which then leads now into probably the most important reflective question, which I think is very, very important and crucial uh, for historians. So I'm going to lay groundwork for this one, Alien, because this one's a heavy hitter. So just brace yourself. So doing this now for two years, meaning wide range of different historians from reenactors, students, enthusiasts, uh, fellow bloggers, and so forth, I've come to realize, just like authors, there are two paths for uh, historians, regardless if you're being like indie historians or historians that work in like for the federal level or whatever. And that is to be an historian and to be known as an historian. To be an historian is an individual dedicated to the field, no matter what discipline you're studying, you're dedicated to helping the scholarship grow and bringing in new uh, readers or new students of history. Not solely motivated by capital, but it's nice to earn a little bit of money now and then. To be known as an historian is an individual dedicated to, you know, showcasing their work, whether it's their capstone, their thesis that they worked on in college or graduate school, and they're really, really trying to hone it in and say, you know, this research is very, very important. And not to say it isn't, as because it probably is. And each one has its own hurdles and trials um, going forward. But I definitely feel for first time, for historians you know, just out of college and going into, you know, the workforce, whether, you know, federal level or independent, um, and that concludes, you know, content creation, there is the misconception that their project that they've worked on that, you know, that they've honed for years is instantly going to guarantee them, you know, their legacy. It's not, it's not true. There are exceptions, of course, to that rule in every field, generally speaking. But typically, especially in history, you really have to work for it. You really have to hone your writing. Because at the bottom stage, like you are pretty much just, you know, as one of my uh, fellow historians said, like a nobody in the field. Like you really have to showcase your work. And that does take time. And especially going now into the blogger perspective, one of my uh, fellow historians who also is a book blogger said, you know, there were some books I had to say, you know, no to because, you know, it, it just wasn't, you know, for me. And everyone would say, but this book's, you know, the ticket, it's really popping, people are really buying this. But it also goes into, you know, that book's, you know, bread and butter or the meat and potatoes. Like, is the scholarship behind it really worth the effort? Because let's be honest. There are many historical books out there that definitely have needed a second revision to really fine tune their point. And, you know, that's that's a hard thing to say, but it is ultimately true. And going back to the main question or not main question, but the main point is just like being an author in the field of history, there is no guarantee that your first anything is going to instantly give you whatever you want. But it should not deter you from that goal, if you're truly passionate about it, if you want to be known as like the best uh, history blogger or best historian or whatever, it's going to take some time. It's not impossible. It's just going to take some time. So, Amy, what are your thoughts on this discussion? I think that's a there. It's it's a very multifaceted discussion. Um, starting with the two different um, the two different branches that you were talking about before, I work in academia, and so I understand. Given my, I very much was a well, what can I do with my history degree? Way back when, mm -hmm. and because, and now you know, it's been 14, 15 years since I graduated. Since then, I work in IT. I don't, I don't work in the history field. I never have. Um, credit, if you looked at my credentials, I probably could have applied to jobs in as an adjunct professor or as a librarian or an archivist or working in these, you know, there's all of these different avenues. But I think as much as it pains me to have to say it, it's a very tough field to be into. Yes. Um, 
jobs are few and far between. There's a high level of competition. The pay and the benefits aren't there. And that was honestly, that business aspect of it steered me away when I was looking, which is mm-hmm. how I ended up stumbling into IT. <laughs> yeah. And and so I, but I don't want that outlook to, or that almost sounds a little bit dismal. I don't want that outlook to sour the notion of wanting to educate oneself in history or English or philosophy or any of those social sciences fields because the tangible benefits and skills that you gain are applicable no matter where you go. Um, But the challenge with somebody who wants to be solely an academic and want to write books and things like that, I think it's, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think you're also, people are also going to run up against there may be your particular book or piece of work may not necessarily be to everyone's bit of taste. And I actually experienced this with an author myself. I read his book. I thought I, I, it was, it, the book itself wasn't terrible, but I was not a huge fan of the protagonist. And I gave very, I, I thought I gave good reasoning as to why Um, the, I don't want to call out the author or anything like that, but it just wasn't, there were, there were some issues that I had with mm. the protagonist and, and it's not from the, the, um, the author emailed me about it and we discussed it a little bit. And I still remember him saying that, oh yeah, my, my books have, or this is five stars on Amazon and Goodreads and everything like that. And it's like, that's great. And I'm glad, and I probably would be falling in line with some of those people who've occasionally just given five stars and, but other people had really great feedback and that that's fine. But I'm like, I'm not trying to criticize you as a researcher or anything. That wasn't that. It was just this particular work didn't do it for me. And I, I think as someone who writes content, if somebody had a criticism of my work, I think it depends on how it's framed. Mm -hmm. It's not trying to attack you as a person. (laughs) Then I think it's fine. But I also think it takes, I don't think there's anything wrong with being, it, it can be a hard pill to swallow, but to try to take feedback with a little bit of, especially if it's given in the right spirit, that there's nothing wrong with that because it helps you grow as a writer. Um, I just know in, at the time we, when you're receiving it, it may feel like just, it may cause you to question what you're doing. And I think that it's a very natural feeling to have, but hopefully anyone who goes through it, it, it comes through on the other side because it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with what you did necessarily but I mean there's nothing it's about how you choose to take that feedback and how you use it do you use it to motivate you further and maybe do another revision if needed or 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 again if it's given in just in the spirit of being mean then you can safely probably ignore it (laughs) right so it's just it it's history and in the state of content creation and being a blogger and things like that we are consuming information it's the amount of content out there just grows exponentially every second and there are so many big wigs out there that it's going to be tough to be a big wig and to see a big wigs um Mm -hmm. and so i think that going back to the imposter syndrome discussion we were having before you may not be the biggest fish in the in your pond but or in the ocean but don't forget that you are still probably a huge fish in someone's pond yeah even if it doesn't seem like that definitely you know i have to be 100 percent, and you know just like you when i got out of college i was thinking you know what am i going to do with my history degree being you know a classical historian i want to work in the museums uh be a researcher be an archivist but you know, just as you say, you know, the requirements for the job are, you know, way out there. I don't have, you know, the experience and it was deflating. And then that's when, you know, I realized that I have another avenue, which is, of course, writing. And I realized I could write history. I could be a freelance or contract magazine writer. And that was probably the best decision that I've ever made. And it's been a wonderful experience because it allowed me to write about different periods of history and really showcase, you know, not just a my history because I know what I'm talking about, 
but B, my writing that I'm very fluid with my writing because, you know, it shows that I'm not all academic. I can write a little bit of prose that weaves into the scholarship where it's engaging, but still, you know, thought provoking. And at the end of the day, it was, you know, incredible. And I got to meet a new branch of people, which is especially crucial for historians who are content creators. So for you, Amy, are there any people you would like to give a shout out to who have helped you understand the business of content creation, especially historical content creation? So I, one person, and I've given her a call up before, uh, uh, is Kirsten Marcel. She is an author who has written a couple of books, um, time travel mysteries during, or um, time travel series set during the American Revolution. And she was probably one of the first authors who actually reached out to me um, to read and review her book. And that kind of was the one that, kind of, not, not from the business aspect of like, hey, this is something I could actually, you know, offer people if that's what they want. And of course I don't charge for it, but it was one of those like set that or um, spark that mindset of, oh, so I can set up, I want to say I can set up a type of transactional relationship with people if they've decided to reach out to me. Again, not necessarily where any money is exchanged, but mm. like uh, it, it's, and that kind of sparked um, that kind of spark that particular um, aspect of what I do as a creator, but then also very recently, Amy Rodriguez, who runs the, um, she runs the Instagram account called Fair Thee Well, and she also mm. has a, um, a Substack publication as well. She actually commissioned me to, and this is for more of a, a tangible business act aspect. She um, asked me to create a series of book hosters for an author. And that again, prompted the O. Oh, I can do this. Mm -hmm. and, and and so I think that, it, and it's been, it's still in the work, all of it's still in the works right now, um, but the author was very happy with the coasters, which was awesome. And so it's those connections that I've made, um, not just necessarily for the We Exchange information and support, and it formed a very wonderful community, but also from the more hardcore of what am I going to be, how am I going to establish a niche Mm. where there's plenty of people filling that niche anyways and those two particularly have helped paint or guide me or mold just a little bit of enough to be like okay this is what I can start focusing on um a little bit and it's been it's been very very helpful awesome that is really really great to hear Amy and we're almost nearing the end of this incredible historian's interview so we're now going to get to the last two questions so i'm going to combine them together so the first part is so looking back on your life right now how different would your life be if you did not create the bookish historian and secondly with everything that you learned thus far about being a content creator what is your word of wisdom to other historical content creators who want to get a head start, or even if it's not just history, but they still want to do content creation, what is your word of wisdom to them? Yeah, absolutely. So if I wasn't doing the bookish historian, I probably would be, I would still probably be reading and writing, or at least reading, but I wouldn't probably have too many people to talk to. Um, I'm <laughs> very much an introvert, and so it, it's been hard for me to come out of my shell at least online I you know there's obviously a certain facade that you portray to the world but it's I would be communicating especially because all of this came up during COVID I think it would mentally it would have been a strain to not have an outlet for some type of social engagement um and so I think that I'd be a lot less articulate and concise and um, things of that nature, I wouldn't have met the connections that I have formed the community that I'm grateful to be a part of, things like that. And so I think that there's been a lot of practical benefits of, you know, getting better at writing or getting better at researching, getting better at writing, finding resources, things like that. But also there's, I've made a, a large amount of friends through here and it's been awesome. Um, as far as advice for somebody who's just entering this sphere, the biggest advice I have is just keep going. It gets better. Mm. Um, I, 
you'll be the first to admit that it can be mentally draining um, yes. to put up to spend hours putting together a an article or something and you don't get any likes or you don't get anything and don't be afraid to just just push through it let yourself feel it and then not say just move on but keep moving on keep doing the next thing and don't be afraid to reach out for those people who may engage with you who you talk with regularly ask just ask for feedback because i've asked a few people for feedback and it's been great um and and just knowing who you're talking to it's it's not like they're going to try to set you up for failure it's they want you to succeed so so don't be afraid to just pick yourself up and keep going it does get better 100 and with that viewers and listeners we have come to both the end of this amazing historian's interview as well as the final interview for the month of October. Thank you all so very much for your love and support. And I want to give a huge thank you to Amy for coming on the show, making her official debut here on the channel. And I promise this probably won't be the last time we see her. I guarantee it. Now, Amy, before we end, where can people find and engage with you on social media and are there any special blogs you would like to announce that we can expect on your site? Yeah, absolutely. So normally I'm found at thebookishhistorian.com. Again, it is currently up for, I'm in the process of rebuilding it. Um, there's been some technical issues that I need to work through, um, but that will be available hopefully in the next month or so, um, hopefully sooner, but we'll see. Um, otherwise, you can find me at thebookishhistorian.substack.com. Um, and that's where I have been doing a lot of blogging lately. So some recent posts that I have been putting together have been uh, yesterday. I released a short blurb on the legend of Sleepy Hollow and how it related to or how it had some of its roots in the American Revolution. Uh, the week before that, I wrote about um, Juliana de Fontevro. I probably butchered the French pronunciation, but she was an illegitimate daughter of King Henry I, who uh, Order of Vitalis said uh, she tried to assassinate her father. Uh, <laughs> um, and coming up, especially in the next week or so, I plan to do a post on uh, the sinking of the white ship and the um, death of William Medellin, who was Henry I's um, only legitimate heir, and how that messed up the uh, English succession in the 12th century. Um, and then if you are on Instagram, I'm also available at the underscore bookish underscore historian. And so that's where you'll see posts on on this day. You'll see some branding things of the um, items that are coming up, um, things I've posted. You'll see book reviews. You'll see a little bit of this, a little bit of that. So I try to um, post on a regular cadence there as well. Excellent. I will link all those down below in the description of this video. And before we end, my viewers and listeners, I do want to make a quick announcement. Now, if you follow me on my newsletter, I always post it the first of every month, but uh, it will be up tomorrow for November because my first guest for November will be, of course, November 1st. So be on the lookout for that when it drops with all the new guests as well as a few other additions to the channel and what to expect going forward for the rest of this year and the new year. Make sure to like and subscribe and comment down below what was your favorite part of the interview. And as always, this is The Wandering Scribe and The Wandering Quill signing out, wishing you all a wonderful morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are in the world.